This is a special edition of Capital Ideas TV. Coming up, top investment ideas for 2018, featuring the CEOs of Park Lawn, Diversified Royalty, and X-Block Technology. We'll have some top picks from a leading brokerage, plus Fabrice Taylor on a winning investment strategy. Hello and welcome to this special edition of Capital Ideas TV. I'm Mark Bunting. The start of a new year is the time for investors to plan ahead for the year to come. Here at Capital Ideas Media, we've rounded up some of our top stock ideas for 2018 and scanned the investment world to find out where the smart money is heading. When it comes to investing, no two years are exactly alike. A sector that's a top performer one year could be a dog the next. And the same goes for individual stocks. But there are some tried and true methods that can maximize your chance of finding a successful stock. And there's one in particular we want to draw attention to in 2018. And that is investing in stocks hitting 52-week highs. It's a strategy Capital Ideas TV contributor Fabrice Taylor has talked about on the show. And it's one he's used to great success over many years. Here's Fabrice on why it works. The theory behind it is that the, the market is the best investor, right? It's smarter than you are on average, than I am. And so it's making choices and not the whole market, it's not that the whole market agrees, but like the preponderance of it, the smart money is in there early and it's deciding something's gonna happen here. There are good things happening here and it will generally drive the price of a stock higher despite the resistance. And that's when stocks start hitting highs. And what you wanna do is buy stocks that are starting to hit 52-week highs because here's what they all tend to do. They tend to do it over and over and over and over again for several years, especially if you get in there early. Now, it doesn't work for everything. Obviously, very volatile companies or illiquid ones or small ones doesn't work as well, right? Because, I mean, if you take a micro cap that's not very liquid, it can literally hit a high and a low in one month. But for bigger names that are more liquid, that are better known, where the information is generally well established, you can do very well. And that's a very good way of investing if you want to be a do-it-yourselfer and have a chance at beating the market. There's some legwork involved beyond just buying the 52-week high list. Investors need to understand why a stock is hitting a high and if the factors behind it are likely to be sustainable over several quarters. If those ingredients appear to be in place, you could have a winner on your hands. Fabrice explains how the higher highs pattern takes shape using Linamar as an example. It's because earlier this year, it looked like auto sales were rolling over. It is cyclical, obviously. There's only so many cars that are gonna be bought. There's only so many people who buy cars. And you can see there was weakness in Linamar and others. Just this week, we had auto sales sharply higher. But look how smart the market is. It anticipates it by a couple of months. It sees it coming. And that's what I mean by the intelligence of Mr. Market. Sometimes we make fun of it. Warren Buffett makes fun of him sometimes. But generally, he's pretty smart. And you can see it in this chart. And if you took the cues from the market and you bought it back then, you'd be doing very well. 52-week high investing strategies will become a regular feature on Capital Ideas TV this year. We'll keep track of the stocks hitting those fresh highs and offer insight on whether that indicates more gains will follow. Stay tuned for that. One of the stocks that perfectly exemplifies the 52-week high investing strategy is Parklawn Corporation. The company runs funeral homes and provides death care services. The stock has traded relatively sideways since debuting on the TSX Venture Exchange in 2011. But in 2014, that all changed. Parklawn acquired new plots of land as part of an expansion drive, and business started to pick up. It also benefited from demographic shifts that continue to unfold today. As a result, the stock hit a 52-week high in mid-2014 and went on to higher highs for the rest of the year. The same pattern took shape in 2016. As you can see to the right, a 52-week high followed by fresh highs in the subsequent months. That trend continued to play out after Parklawn graduated to the Toronto Stock Exchange. In April, the stock reached a 52-week high and continued climbing from there to a record. The shares are trading around that high watermark today and were up roughly 30% in 2017. 
It's no surprise Parklawn is a favorite of Fabrice Taylor, who sees good things ahead for the stock this year. The company has notched steady organic growth, offers a nice dividend payout to investors, and makes strategic acquisitions. Last year, Parklawn made a transformative acquisition in the U.S. and used part of an $80 million financing to get the deal done. CEO Andrew Clark sat down with Capital Ideas TV in August and discussed where else he intends to deploy those funds. We have uh, a number of organic projects in the pipeline. We have uh, some mausoleum uh, development opportunities that we're looking at. Uh, we have some uh, on-site funeral home development opportunities that we're looking at, uh, particularly in, in the Houston market. And we have an attractive uh, M&A pipeline as well. It's, uh, uh, you know, as, as we grow, the pipeline continues to become more robust, so we, we don't have any concerns that we'll be able to allocate that capital. The dividend yield sits around 2.5%. Uh, mm -hmm. uh, are you going to continue to, or is the plan to continue to, to grow it? Our dividend has been steady since I joined in 2011. Um, so well, uh, we discuss our dividend policy on a regular basis. Our our go forward strategy uh, to, in, in terms of capital allocation is is not focused on growing the dividend. It's compounding our uh, our capital internally. What's your payout ratio? Uh, on cash flow, our payout ratio is about forty two or forty three percent. So mm -hmm. so lots of uh, lots of comfort there. <laughs> Parklawn is a darling among the analysts who cover the company. All six of them have a buy rating on the stock. A passing glance at the demographic breakdown of the U.S. pretty much sums up the enthusiasm. Data from the U.S. Census Bureau shows a surge in the number of people entering the back half of their lives. From 2006 to 2016, the number of people aged 55 to 64 grew by 75%, while the number of those aged 65 and older grew 47%. That massive graying of the population should create a boom in demand for the services Parklawn offers, first in cemetery arrangements and later in funeral and cremation services. Similar dynamics are playing out in Parklawn's core market of Canada. Well, Pico the Beans is a lifestyle brand. I was fundamentally confused why there wasn't an apparel product that fostered a lifestyle of play for children. Uh, I want the world to look at the lifestyle of a child as something that needs to be preserved and protected. And uh, we create a, an apparel product that makes them feel good. It allows them to get outside and become who they are. And that's what we want. We want to foster a playful life. 2017 was a strong year for the company's Capital Ideas TV featured on the show. Our winning stocks outpaced declines of our laggard stocks by more than two and a half times. And there are a couple of companies we're particularly upbeat about in 2018, given the big strides they made this past year. Here are a few that stand out. If there's one executive who understands the royalties model better than most people, it's Sean Morrison. The CEO of Diversified Royalty Corp pioneered the multi-royalty model in the 1990s and has been pitching it ever since. Those that have taken his lead have generally done well for themselves, and the same could be said for the company. Shares of Diversified Royalty rocketed higher in the back half of last year and now sit at their highest level since 2006. It all started with a transformative acquisition. In late August, the company agreed to buy the trademarks to the Air Miles Rewards Program, one of the most recognizable brands in Canada. The stock popped higher, and then in October, the Bank of Montreal renewed its contract with Air Miles. That was expected, but crucial, given BMO makes up roughly a quarter of the reward program's revenue. As a result, diversified royalty shares jumped once again. The company now holds the trademark to auto repair shop Mr. Lube, Realtor Sutton, and Air Miles. But it's not stopping there, with plenty of cash still on the books. Thanks to a debentures sale, the company is plotting another major move. CEO Sean Morrison joined us in October and detailed his strategy. We earn about 21 cents a share. We pay a dividend of 22 cents a share approximately, and we have $33 million of cash on our balance sheet to do the next deal. So our objective now is we have three top line royalties. Uh, our objective is to kind of over the next 12 months buy one to three high quality royalties um, to build that pool out and make it a much larger business, more diversified. And we think as we grow the business and be, make it more diversified, 
um, that shareholders will get a, a steadier, more stable income stream. Uh, we should trade at a lower yield and hopefully uh, if we do a creative acquisitions, our dividends should increase and the combination of lower yield and increased dividends should be good for share price and shareholders. Morrison says he's looking to acquire the trademarks to a brand worth around $50 million so that he won't have to drum up additional capital to pay for it. It shouldn't take too long to raise cash organically anyway, given how lucrative the Air Miles brand is. And we're not just talking in Canada, but globally. At 70%, Air Miles Canada is tied for the highest household penetration rate in the world among so-called coalition loyalty plans that have multiple brands under their umbrella. Coalition loyalty plans have become so valuable thanks to some key advantages over their single brand peers. They offer customers a wider selection of brands to earn points with and a greater selection of rewards to choose from. They also make it cheaper for individual brands to participate in the loyalty program because administrative costs are shared. And they offer participating brands a richer set of data on customer behaviors so they can better target ads and promotions. The Air Miles Canada program earned parent company Alliance Data Systems nearly $1 billion in revenue. Diversified Royalty gets a 1% slice of that pie, meaning it can bank on around $8.5 million of royalty payments per year from the program. Couple that with an expected 5% growth in Air Miles issuance in 2017 and beyond, and Diversified Royalty should have the dry powder it needs to grow its business in a big way. One of the bigger news stories in Canadian business in 2017 was the troubles of Home Capital Group. The company's issues with some brokers falsifying client documentation in order to qualify them for loans sent the firm into a tailspin. Much of the Canadian consumer lending sector was dragged down with it, including consumer loans provider GoEasy. At first blush, that would seem to make some sense. GoEasy lends money to clients with lower end credit scores, so it definitely operates in a higher risk market. But dig a little deeper and any comparison to home capital falls apart. For one, GoEasy has a rigorous screening process for new loan applications. The company makes its decisions based on an applicant's income and their credit rating. And it also requires a treasure trove of documentation before it hands out any cash. Ultimately, just 15% of new loan applications are approved. That's led to a remarkably stable and predictable business, despite the riskier nature of the clientele. GoEasy has consistently increased the revenue it generates from its consumer lending, and its operating margins have remained in the 30 to 40% range. However, the rate of soured loans has held within its target range of about 15%. This stability is one reason why Dan Lloyd of Sui Generous argues GoEasy shares were unfairly beaten up earlier in 2017. He maintains the company is the most well-capitalized financial firm he's ever seen. effectively lend at in the mid 40s and their cost of funding is call it seven between seven and eight percent so that net um, between those two numbers yields you know a very very healthy margin for the company and then uh, do you know what the the figure is in terms of non-performing loans are quite low yeah yeah so it's 13.9 percent to be uh, specific in the last quarter anyway and so the provision against that uh, they generally provision between 14 and 16 percent so they've got a reasonable buffer there um, just on the quarter to quarter basis. So 13.9 is what they charged off in the last quarter. So, but, but very high compared to a, a big bank, obviously. Yep, yeah. ab absolutely. So uh, that is, of course, offset against the very high net interest margin of call it 37% in Q1 versus maybe two for a bank. Um, and the other, uh, the other very interesting thing to think about is the equity buffer that, uh, that GoEasy has. So on a total capitalization basis, maybe 40% of the capitalization is equity, whereas banks, you run roughly between 10 and 12% of CET1 capital anyway. Um, so even if you did have a spike in uh, non-performing loans, you have a very large buffer so that the company or the shareholders theoretically wouldn't have to start taking losses on those loans. Lloyd began buying GoEasy shares amid the springtime pullback in the stock, arguing the deep value they represented was too much to ignore. His call seems to be on the mark so far. GoEasy shares have climbed back to the high water mark they reached in April after slumping to a seven month low shortly after his June interview with Capital Ideas TV. Now that those concerns about the consumer lending market are mostly in the past, 
GoEasy can get back to pitching investors on its ambitious growth plan. The company believes there are strong fundamentals underpinning its key consumer base which is only getting larger. GoEasy points out nearly one in five Canadians own a credit score below 700, and they collectively hold more than $165 billion in non-mortgage debt. Both of those figures look poised to rise as millennials and new immigrants continue to enter the credit market. Those two groups often lack strong credit backgrounds and make use of GoEasy services. As a result, GoEasy is looking to ramp up its revenue and operating margins at a healthy clip in each of the next three years. 2018 is expected to be another year of major expansion for the firm. It plans to open up 30 new locations in the next 12 months. It also expects to bump up its revenue growth rate by at least a full percentage point and fatten up its operating margins. By the end of fiscal 2020, GoEasy wants to hold a loans portfolio worth at least a billion dollars and earn operating margins in excess of 40%. Make sure to tune in to Capital Ideas TV when we'll interview GoEasy CEO David Ingram in January. He'll give us the latest on what investors can expect in the first half of this year and how he plans to finance that hardy expansion strategy. One of the more fascinating technology companies we've spoken to recently is XBlock. That's the company camped out in a nuclear fallout shelter in rural Nova Scotia, building blockchain applications for the enterprise market. Don't let that quirkiness fool you. XBlock is a serious business and they're making some real progress. XBlock founder Jonathan Bahai joined us for an interview in November and explained the first decentralized app or DAP his company is working on. One of the very first decentralized applications that we're working on is a 50-50 type of application. 50-50 uh, is very common around the world and it's used for charities and, and as a means of being able to raise money for uh, good causes. Uh, so this decentralized application will run on the PeerPlays blockchain and it will allow people to have uh, not only global access but it'll be easy to use, it'll be white label, it'll be something that'll make it auditable so that organizations will be much easier to be able to do 50-50 draws. It's a big issue for a lot of small organizations. Since our sit-down, XBlock has launched its first white paper for its 50-50 draw decentralized blockchain app. The program allows charities to fundraise with very marginal expenses in exchange for a percentage of the money raised in the draw. XBlock has released a programming code to developers and will test it out ahead of its commercial debut. The company expects to generate revenue from the 50-50 draw app by the second quarter of 2018. That early inkling of revenue will put XBlock among the companies contributing to a rapidly growing blockchain market. Analysts at Ameri Research estimate the distributed ledger technology will be worth nearly $4 billion in 2018. Eventually, it's expected to balloon into a $16 billion market by 2024. That works out to a compound annual growth rate of roughly 28% per year. Large enterprises will make up about two thirds of the industry's revenue. However, the small market enterprises like the ones XBlock is initially targeting will evolve into a sizable market as well. It's still very early days for XBlock as a public company. It went public on the Canadian Securities Exchange in mid-November and has held relatively steady since then. However, if the company is able to develop a blockchain app that is adopted on a larger scale, that could galvanize its top line. That in turn could spark a major run-up in its shares, given how enthusiastic investors have been for everything blockchain. For many companies, we tell them that their data is like the Mona Lisa. It's incredibly valuable. Every large organization in the world right now has a 42% compounded annual growth in their data storage and the old methods aren't going to work. Leonovus technology was built under the following assumption. All your investment in network technology and security technology and hardware, we assume it all fails and the bad guys are gonna get access to your data. With Leonovus, we're the last line of defense. It's around this time of year that many investment firms publish their list of stocks to watch for the coming year. They're a great way to get investors thinking about which companies to keep on their radar and some key catalysts that could drive those stocks higher. We rounded up a bunch of calls that stood out to us and share them with you now. 
Raymond James is betting on an American phenomenon coming up north with one of its top picks for 2018. Their analysts have put a strong buy rating and a $3 price target on self-storage warehouse operator Storage Vault Canada. It makes sense when you see how American self-storage companies have performed over the past five years. Here's a look at the performances of the five largest self-storage operators measured against the broader MSCI REIT index. In a word, they've all crushed the composite index. In fact, self-storage has been the best performing asset class in the U.S. over the past decade with a 16% annualized return. And while the industry stumbled a bit in 2017 due to overbuilding, the party's just getting started in Canada. Raymond James points to a 90% return in 2017. Storage Vault was the best performing real estate stock of the year. It's also the only publicly traded self-storage company in Canada, so investors looking to play the space have only one place to go. The analysts say the company displayed unparalleled growth last year and a repeat could be in store for 2018. Storage Vault was able to jack up rental rates for its units in the Toronto and Vancouver areas by 10 to 15 percent. In other cities, it was able to raise rates between 4 and 6 percent. That helped the company record its eighth straight quarter of double-digit same property net operating income. Raymond James sees that cooling a bit to about 8 percent this year, but funds from operations are expected to rise by 48 percent and that asset value by 20 percent. That would be tops in Canada once again. That breakneck pace of growth has allowed Storage Vault to rapidly gain scale in the market. The company has gone from just 10 storage locations to 87 in less than three years. The surge in its stock price has allowed the company to tap financing options at more attractive rates and ramp up its expansion strategy. It's also internalized its management team and acquired units in the process. There are two other factors the Raymond James team likes about Storage Vault. One, the management team owns a collective 40% of the company's shares and are thus very aligned with shareholder interests. And number two, no other real estate stock can match Storage Vault's flexibility in a rising interest rate environment. The company can adjust its rental rates every four weeks, giving it the ultimate ability to weather any hike to interest rates. Higher borrowing costs are a real risk in 2018, so that may prove to be a major selling point for investors. Canaccord Genuity is bullish on the consumer products sector and it singled out some key beneficiaries for 2018. The firm did a good job picking winners last year and some key ingredients emerged that helped drive returns. It sees those factors carrying into this year. They include higher debt to disposable income among Canadian consumers, signs of an early economic bounce back in Alberta, the ongoing encroachment of e-commerce onto traditional brick and mortar retail, and some key acquisitions. Now it's that last point that's expected to bolster the fortunes of casino operator Great Canadian Gaming. The company is one of the top picks by the Canaccord team, which has a buy rating and a $38 price target attached to the stock. Great Canadian Gaming is in the process of closing on one of its acquisitions of three casino properties in Ontario. That will make the province a major market for the company and power its next leg of growth. The Canaccord analysts highlight Great Canadian Gaming's track record of boosting profitability by renovating and expanding casinos it purchases. More acquisitions could be on the horizon as well. Great Canadian has submitted requests for a proposal to casino bundles in the Niagara and central regions of Ontario, and we'll hear back on those applications in early 2018. Canaccord says the company is well positioned to fund any additional growth opportunities thanks to its low debt to EBITDA ratio. As far as valuation goes, the analysts say Great Canadian should be trading at a premium to its regional peers and more in line with Las Vegas casino operators. Instead, the stock is materially undervalued in their view. That's even after the stock's 25% jump in 2017 and a move to a record high in September. One thing to keep in mind about Canaccord Genuity's enthusiasm for Great Canadian Gaming is that it's striking out on its own with this call. Data from MarketBeat shows there are currently three buys and four holds on the stock. Meanwhile, the consensus price target among the group is just shy of $32 per share, which implies a 6.5% upside. That's far short of Canaccord's prediction for $38. Also, Ontario's finance minister calls an investigation into the company's main BC casino routine. 
but it's something to think about for any investors looking to roll the dice on great Canadian gaming's expansion story. So we have a tagline, and that's like the Desert Line Energy is the next producing lithium mine in the world. Not only at Desert Line Energy, we're ready to meet the demand of the lithium market today by coming into production now. We're also looking out into the future and we see a bright and opportunity for us to be a long-term producer producing lithium chemicals for the growing lithium market today and then into the future. In December, Capital Ideas TV and Seattle Mobile shared a first on the show. CEO Mark Seelenfreund did the first ever live demo of his company's new flagship communication system for commercial vehicles. It promises to consolidate several devices into one product that wireless carriers can offer to commercial clients. That way, they make money from customers that otherwise would have been paying third-party vendors. Here's a sample of how that live demo went. Basically what this device does, it allows you to make regular phone calls, cellular phone calls, push to talk over cellular, which is like the next generation of two-way radio systems. It allows you to have data sessions and applications, so you can have navigation, fleet management, various applications that are relevant for commercial vehicles. So what I'm going to show you first is, if you see here, this is a fleet management package, and this is from a company called Big Road, and it's embedded in the product, and then you can have fleet management on the product. You can also open up Waze and have navigation. So here you see Waze. So basically you don't have to have an additional device for navigation. It's all in one device. Now we're going to make a phone call. So you can hear the call quality because at the end of the day, the most important feature in this product is the call quality and the fact that it has very good call quality and very good echo cancellation. Now you're phoning a colleague here. Yep. Hey, it's Glenn. Hey, Glenn. How are you? I'm well, Mark. Hope it's going well with you. Thank you. <laughs> All right. Have a good day. Very good. Thanks. So that was a regular standard mobile phone call. So you don't have to have an additional device to make a cellular phone call. Now I'm going to demonstrate to you what is called push to talk over cellular. Push to talk over cellular, as we mentioned, is a way to speak to multiple people at the same time simultaneously. So basically this allows a dispatch to speak to 10 trucks or 100 trucks simultaneously as opposed to calling each one separately. So now we're going to go and call Glenn again. And basically what we're going to do is you're going to hear that beep, similar to what it was in the mic network, if you right. remember. Uh, Glenn, can you hear me? Hi, Mark. Yeah, I can hear you loud and clear. It sounds really good on my end. Despite this exciting new product offering, shares of Seattle Mobile slumped about 10% in the back half of 2017. Seelen Freund believes the hoopla around blockchain and cannabis deals caused some investors to shift out of Seattle stock. However, he's adamant that once they realize the massive market opportunity his company is tapping into, they'll return in droves. That opinion is shared not just by Capital Ideas TV, but by analyst Daniel Kim at Paradigm Capital. He believes Seattle's combination of disruptive technology and first mover advantage signal big things to come for the company. In a recent research note, Kim writes, quote, as its portfolio rapidly transitions from 3G to 4G, we see a potential for explosive growth next year as the company begins volume deliveries in Canada and the US, end quote. Kim adds that his revenue and EBITDA estimates for Seattle Mobile are on the conservative side. He maintains his buy rating on the stock with a 12-month price target of 85 cents per share. Make sure to check out our interview with Seattle Mobile CEO Mark Seelenfreund on our website and on our YouTube page as well for more on the company's investment thesis. From the heart of the financial district in downtown Toronto, that's it for our special edition of Capital Ideas TV. I'm Mark Bunting. Be sure to subscribe to our YouTube channel so you don't miss an episode. And for more great investment ideas and great research, subscribe to CapitalIdeasResearch.com. Thanks a lot for watching and thanks for investing like a pro. We look forward to bringing you more excellent investment ideas in 2018. We'll see you next time.